Welcome to the HJ Talks About Abuse podcast. In this podcast, we talk about sexual abuse cases in the hope it will assist listeners in openly discussing topics which have been ignored for too long. This podcast is brought to you by the abuse team at Hugh James. We are lawyers, so we do tend to speak about the legal aspects of abuse cases, but we aren't too shy to speak up about the broader issues faced by survivors too. Hello podcast listeners, I'm Alan Collins and I'm joined today by my colleague Sam Barker. Hello. Hello Sam. So this podcast is going to be about the question, do lawyers push CSA survivors into making compensation claims? So that's the question that we're going to talk about and we can say right at the start, no they don't and certainly not us. We certainly do not push survivors of child sexual abuse into making compensation claims. So this is something that was raised at the Independent Inquiry into Child Sex Abuse recently in the accountability and reparations hearings, as I understand it. Yes, that's right. It's it's in the context of ICSA and accountability and reparation. ICSA was looking at basically that accountability and reparation for survivors Mm. of child sexual abuse. And so it's looking at the means by which survivors can get compensation if they want, what they have to go through to get compensation, how the justice system works, or depending on your point of view, how it might not work, how many survivors are not able to access any kind of justice, and some that do end up in the justice system not getting justice. So lots of thorny, interesting issues and questions, but one of those was, do lawyers push survivors into making compensation claims? So that's what I thought would make well, I'm glad that you a good subject for a podcast. I'm, I'm glad you came out straight out of the gate saying there that that is not the case, and um, I'd back that up by saying that uh, you know recommending a client or pushing a client to take a civil case when it is not in their best interests would actually be a breach of the duty that we owe the client to advise them in relation to the case and to advise them as to their best interests. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be unethical and it would end, into t- end in tears for everybody. It just wouldn't work. Absolutely. So that's a, you know, a pretty straight position to be in. You know, you just can't do it. So what we do here, and we can talk about this in a, a little bit, Sam, it, about way of explaining what we do, which is that we try to provide what I like to think is a holistic approach in which we put the potential client, the survivor, in a position where they can make choices. Absolutely. We give them the pros and cons and make sure they understand that if a case doesn't settle, then there is the potential that they would have to be in a witness box being cross-examined because obviously that's something that's very daunting for people and they need to know that that's a possibility. Also make sure that they know what the potential outcomes of the case are, what's going to be involved on their side, what's going to be involved on our side. So we put them into a position where they can make an informed choice and that's, that's what we have to do. Yeah, and one of the choices that they have is not to do anything. If a survivor, having listened to what the options are, uh, are at liberty to say, no, not for me, it's not something that I don't want to do. But to put them in that position where they can come to that respectable, understandable decision, they need to be told how it works, what the options are. So they need to know, well, can I bring a claim against the abuser or the institution that I was living in when I got abused or are there other options? We talk to them about the involvement of the police, if the police have not been involved or if they've already been involved. We talk about what steps they would have to take if they wanted to pursue a case. That's right. Yeah, so for example, you you know, we have to explain that it's quite likely that they would have to be seen by a psychiatrist so that we all understand the effects of the sexual abuse on them as a person, both physically and psychiatrically. We all need to know that. And we have to explain that some cases go to court. That's right, yeah. And what that involves. What else do we explain? Limitation, the law of limitation. Well, we explain the law that defines all of the claims and whether their case, you know, what the probability is that their case will be successful. We also explain what we need from them in terms of witness evidence or who we need to speak to or what documentation they need to provide. And I, I would like to stress here that, the, you know, 
if some it's quite often that we have these conversations which involve quite a lot of work and the choice is sometimes understandably made not to pursue a case and all the way up until that point we of course do all that work for free it's not something that we charge anyone for and i would say that of uh, of all the inquiries we get and spend on the phone time spent on the phone speaking to people and working through the issue that they have and realizing that there might not be a case but providing them with options about next steps I'd say honestly about 60% of the calls we have are, are that and um, we point people in the right direction and that's something we don't do, or uh, we don't charge for. And very often we're the only people that the survivor will ever, ever get that information from because one of the big deficits in the UK is the fact that survivors are not properly signposted, they are not that's told right. what their legal rights are and those who ought to be giving that advice, that information to survivors don't, or when they do, it's impartial or inaccurate. Yep. So survivors, by and large, are not well served by those out there who should be signposting survivors to the right places and the right people to get legal advice, treatment, whatever support that they actually need or the advice that they actually need. So I think it's a big failing it's something that I feel personally very strong about, and we know that ICSA has picked this up and made recommendations, and also the APPG, well, that's uh, right, yeah. um, the Westminster Parliament, uh, has also picked up on all of this. But the state, in its many guises, I think needs to go a thousand miles further because what it provides at the moment is totally, totally inadequate. Absolutely. And it's, you know, uh, when somebody comes to the end of a criminal case, they really rely on the, the police officers or whoever they've been dealing with to guide them through that criminal process, to point them in the right direction for the next steps. And frankly, most of the time they're told that the next step should be the CICA and we just know fundamentally there are huge issues with the CICA um, scheme and so many people fall out of it or aren't eligible or don't uh, indeed receive enough compensation. And it's mandatory for the Crown Court to be making criminal compensation orders to survivors of CSA, but it's not happening. So again, it's just a good example of the system not working. So it's extremely important that survivors, if they don't want to see us, see other experts who specialise in this area, because that's the only way that survivors are going to get the information that they deserve and they need to make informed choices about what they want to do. It's not about uh, the issue of, it's not a case of making anybody do something is about empowering the survivor to make decisions for themselves. Absolutely. And look, you know, frankly, it's absolutely not something we would do to advise or push a survivor to bring a case where there isn't the proper merits for doing so. It would just, doing that could cause so many issues and be so harmful for people. And it's clearly not something that I think generally speaking, lawyers would do. No, that's right. And going off on a slight tangent, uh, I was having a conversation earlier today with somebody who was explaining to me about the concerns that he has that online sexual abuse is not readily understood in this country in that law enforcement is struggling with it. So he was talking about sex offenders in the UK sitting in the comfort of their homes accessing children in Southeast Asia online so they're sort of sat at home directing what's happening in some awful place um, on the other side of the world where the child is being abused for money and they are you know they might be simply watching or on the other hand they might be directing what is taking place yeah and either way they're part of it they're complicit in it yeah so I'm raising that because it's not readily understood that that is not a victimless crime. Of course, it's, you know, you've got victims, you've got real people, real children being abused. And just because there's this sort of mental disconnect because it's on the other side of the world is neither here nor there. And it seems from the conversation that I was having today with this particular person that this is another example of the system not really understanding what's happening and the fact that you've got real victims and those victims have got rights. Absolutely. And it's not for the state in its many guises to pretend otherwise. So, yeah. And and, and also the sentences in relation to those crimes, just 
don't match the severity of what's happening. You know, if somebody gets caught with a laptop that's full of child pornography, you know, they can conceivably walk out with a slap on the wrist, even if they're found guilty for possessing that material. Now, what we're looking at here is the fact that these these images, these videos, they wouldn't exist unless there's a market for it. And the ultimate, you know, if you follow the logical conclusion or you follow where the source is, there's a child that's been abused on the other end. And, uh, you know, if, if there wasn't, if, the, if there wasn't a market for this material, then that abuse might not be happening. I, I think they need to take a – that has to be quite a severe approach taken uh, to this. Yeah, I was saying to this person that personally, in my opinion, the law needs to be changed so that the law and the sentence or the offence actually reflects what's happening. It's not just simply a case of viewing on your laptop. You're actually part of something bigger, and that's what you need to be – like a conspiracy Cross- charge or something. Well, it's um, not um, that word, but no, you know, like but it's, 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 it's a wider about, thing that people yeah, are involved. You in. know, if you're yeah. if you're directing what's happening, you you may as well be in the room with the child and be convicted, prosecuted. You know, you're the person who's absolutely. We've talked yeah, about this before yeah, in the civil context accomplices. as well, where there's yeah. the, a, a common design. That's um, right, but if you, and yeah. civil liability. So it's it's. So I was explaining that yeah, maybe the criminal law needs to be sort of brought in line with what we understand in the civil law where we're looking at it from a victim perspective because we would be saying that that person sat at the laptop is as guilty as as if he or she maybe was in as, was in the room with the yeah, child and as liable indeed that's right so that comes back to victims and those people who are helping victims actually yeah you need to think actually what are my legal rights mm. and get good proper legal advice and information, and then you can make a decision about what you want to do. Absolutely. Well said, Alan. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Sam. And uh, we'll be back with another podcast next week. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of HJ Talks About Abuse. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. If you would like to speak to Alan or I about something you have heard this week, or even if you would like to suggest a topic for a future episode, please do get in touch at aboutabuse at hjtalks.co.uk. 